Okay, uh, are you tired? No, not at all. Ex <laughs> Excellent. I have a second question. Are you the, are you deadly tired? Mm -hmm. Looks like no. <laughs> okay. Well, bef before we start with the very last presentation, let me explain in details uh, what we have after this, because I believe that that time I will have no no time to explain. We'll have uh, uh, buses that come from here, from uh, from, from the parking lot through uh, through St. Petersburg city center, through Sadova 12. It's a, a guest again that's uh, called Maid Max. We have a reservation for a large amount of people, for about two or three hundred uh, people there. Uh, we don't have free beer, but we have a place for, for collaboration. And it is a good transportation from here to beer in the city. Uh, Okay, it will be six buses that uh, start of uh, right, uh, that start arriving and uh, departure uh, right after the last uh, presentation. The last bus will be at 7:50. Okay, everyone got it. So uh, you you just need to uh, to close here all here and to go to the bus, or probably find some other transportation to go to the city. Uh, and it will be no buses back from the from the restaurant to here, uh, so uh, I would advise you to use Uber or uh, Yandex Taxi, and they are not our sponsors. <laughs> okay, so now uh, we are going with the uh, last presentation. It uh, will be presented by Leonard Potterink from Red IBM Company. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah, you can go. <laughs> Hi, um, so I'm going to talk today about uh, portable services, which is a uh, new systemd concept we added in the in the past months, and I think uh, deserves a little bit more focus in the in the wider Linux community. Um, portable services are a little bit uh, like taking the ideas um, that systemd is built on about service management to the next level. Um, and uh, I think they have lots of use cases, um, and I really want to make sure that you're all aware that this exists, and maybe your use case is actually one of those um, where this could be useful. So, what are portable services? Um, portable services are ultimately system services, like the classic ones, like we always had them, like your MySQL or your Apache or your Nginx, like how you always ran it initially with the System 5 in its script and then with the System Unit file with some container features and on. Not all container features, we're not trying to replicate containers here, but some specific ones. Um, you could say also the reverse. It's a little bit like containers, but with some system service features. Again, not all of them, but yeah. Um, when we talk about containers, like uh, not everybody agrees on what that actually means. Like people have different understanding of what a container is. Um, for me, I think, or probably most people, um, three things make up a container. There's first of all, there's resource bundles, right? You you pack um, the main program and all its uh, dependencies, all the shell libraries and whatsoever into one image. There's isolation, right, um, where you uh, isolate the the thing from from the host or from everything else that runs on the system. So containers mostly communicate through networking with other stuff running locally and not with IPC or through the file system and things like that. And then there's delivery, right? Like uh, um, how you get the stuff actually on the images. For portable services, um, we kind of um, look at related stuff, but only a subset of it. First of all, resource panels, yes, absolutely, right? Um, Portable servers are supposed to bring resource bundling, like the ability that you uh, package up your service with all its dependency into one big blob and uh, um, then run things from there. Um, integration, I put that in opposition to the isolation thing, right? Isolation is about separating the containers from the host and everything else that runs on the host. Uh, with portable services, I kind of see I want to focus on integration, right? Which is a traditional strength of what system service management did, right? Like they all can communicate each other with IPC. They all see each other on the process tree. They um, have access um, 
to uh, the same file system and uh, the various other operating system resources there are. Uh, but also a focus on sandboxing, right? Sandboxing I use as a as a terminology, uh, like a security terminology that is not as strict as isolation, but um, uh, gives you some form of uh, security protection against the rest of the system. Um, what do I actually mean by that? Is that it's a lot more modular, right? Like so that we don't um, start out from fully isolated, um, but we um, can isolate individual bits and integrate other bits. Um, portal servers are supposed to be modular. Um, so that uh, you don't have to buy into the full concept of portable services, uh, but some of the bits uh, that we provide is fine too, right? Um, so to uh, philosophically position this concept of portable services against all the other concepts we have, I like to think about an axis, right? Where you have a range from integrated on the left side to isolated on the right side. If I was actually better computer graphics guy, I would probably have drawn a nice, pretty picture about this. Now you have to think that there's a range drawn there somewhere. It starts on the left side with classic system services, right? You have full integration, um, no isolation, right? This is how system five minute services ran, right? Like they, they can do anything they want on the system. Um, on the right side, you have complete isolation, um, like, like VMs have, right? Like VMs um, are pretty much like completely separate physical systems, right? They, the only way they communicate with the rest of the stuff that might run on the same system is through networking. So effectively, they are separate systems. And then you have a couple of things in the middle, right? Like you have full OS containers a la Lexi, right? Where you have something that kind of is, um, is a system of its own too, right? Like it runs its own networking maybe. Um, it has its own init system and these kind of things. But in other ways, it's a slightly more integrated. Like for example, you can just copy files into it and out of it um, directly without going through the network and things like that. Um, Docker-style microservices I put, would put, put somewhere in the middle of this axis, right? They have some level of uh, <coughs> integration, but they're also not their own systems, right? They don't run their own init systems. They don't do their own networking. Um, but they do have a large uh, level of isolation from the rest of the system, like file system access, things like that. And then the thing that I'm introducing, portable system services, somewhere to the left of this, right? It's more integrated than Docker kind of microservices containers, but it's less integrated um, possibly um, than the classic system services that you ship as a part of the operating system itself. Um, to be more specific, what I mean by this integration and non-integration, consider what's shared and what's not shared. Right? If you think about networking, the classic system service and the portable system services generally do share this, the networking with the host. Docker style uh, containers can do that. Lexi sometimes do, but usually probably not, but it's not that clear. It depends on your use case. And VMs definitely do not share the networking with the host, right? You, get, you give your VM IP address of your own. It does not generally share the IP address of the host, right? Um, now think about the file system. Um, there you should, it's a different. Um, uh, split right for classic system services you do share the same file system with the with uh, the host right you, your Etsy your user your uh, whatever you have is the same as on the host because you see the same things you live in the same namespace uh, already with portable system services that is not shared anymore right because then you ha uh, live in your bundle that's what you see if you access Etsy then you access the Etsy of your bundle not of the host Right, so um, yeah, this the, the the cut where you isolate the file system is further left than for the networking. It's kind of the point I'm trying to make. And think about the other resources as well. PID namespaces. Yeah, classic system services and portable system services generally have their own PID namespaces, right? Like P PID one that the that this environment sees is a different one than PID one on the host. Right, this is true for Docker style microservices. True for um, full OS containers on the LXC because they can run their own init systems, and it's definitely true for VMs. Right. Um, by the way, um, I forgot to say this: if you have any questions about anything that I'm sharing here, completely do interrupt me right away. I much prefer if we have an interactive discussion here um, uh, during the entire talk than just doing uh, questions at the end. So uh, yeah, don't be afraid. Do show up. Um, I'm completely happy if you interrupt me. Um, anyone who has questions at this point? Um, okay, uh, then think about the init system. Yeah, uh, like uh, Docker style microservices, they don't run their own init systems internally, so they still share the init system with the host. But full OS containers, a la Lexi, they definitely run their own init system. Um, device access. Um, yeah, classic system services generally do get um, uh, uh, device access, and so should portable system service, I think. Docker style has some 
some uh, ways to make that happen. And we had an earlier talk about um, uh, how to do this with Lexi. I personally am not convinced that this kind of stuff with like uh, device sharing is really ready for that kind of work, but sure. But and VMs generally do not share the same device access as the host, right? There's, there are certain ways how you can share specific devices, um, but generally you don't. You don't get access to the physical mouse or whatever else. Um, uh, it's all like glued on top if they do that. And logging, for example, is generally very separate as well. Um, for classic system servers and portable system servers, I want to have it fully integrated with the host, but uh, for like uh, Docker style, is already kind of disconnected, and Alexi and KVM definitely have their own logging in place. So, yeah, the, the point of this slide is really um, just um, trying to make you think about how, where containers and VMs and hosts and uh, classic system servers are actually positioned on the scale. And uh, while I pretend there was a one dimensional scale in all of this, a range in all of this, there, of course, is not. Depending on what you're looking on, um, it's a multi dimensional thing, where, how well you can have. Um, integration or not. And the important thing is like the new thing that I want to introduce, which are the portable system services, they're relatively far integrated, but not um, like regular classic system services would be. Um, before we go into details what portable services actually technically are, um, one, uh, a couple of more goals that were important when we designed the portable services. One major goal is leave no artifacts. This is a very important uh, concept. Leave no artifacts. By that, I mean that um, if you install one of these portable services on the system and remove it again, that nothing should change um, like from before and after uh, on the system. This is not the case if you install, for example, Apache or Nginx with an RPM. Right? Because they generally allocate their own system users. System users on Unix are never deleted, right? Because we have this file stickiness problem. The file stickiness problem is that files are owned by users, right? So um, if a user once existed, created a file, and then the user is removed, this file will still belong to the numeric user ID. Um, of that user. Now, if the user stops existing and then is allocated uh, a new user later on and it happens to get the same UID, then suddenly this old file gets owned by this new user, and most likely that new user should not get access to that. Because of that, m most distributions generally never delete users, right? Because they don't want this UID, UID stickiness problems on files to ever surface and become a security problem. So, um, yeah, this basically means if you install all the RPMs from the RHEL archive on your system and remove them all, again, you, yeah, sure, the binaries won't be on disk anymore, but you will have ton loads of users in, in uh, Etsy past WD. So uh, yeah, th this is kind of like the point that I'm trying to make. Um, Docker, um, for example, and VMs in particular have this nice property. Um, you install them, you remove them, and they generally don't leave artifacts in the system, right? The system looks exactly, hopefully, the way it looked before, right? So. Um, yeah, as mentioned, classic RPM classic servers are not like that. If you install uh, uh, Nginx, remove it, shitloads of artifacts. Um, with portable servers, um, the goal is definitely no artifacts. Um, this basically means that any resource um, that a uh, service um, uh, allocates during its runtime, be it files, be it IPC objects, and these kind of things, uh, needs to be lifecycle bound to the service itself, right? So that when the service is shut down, removed from the system, that all these other resources are removed as well. Right? Um, this is actually an interesting problem. Um, another goal is everything in one place. Right? This is, this is kind of the basic idea of containers uh, um, already, um, is you know, if you install an RPM or Debian on your dev package on your system, then it distributes files all over the place. Right? So uh, um, uh, Docker containers and these kind of things, they always isolate stuff, right? Like you have one subdirectory, there's all the resources that the container needs, and then uh, that's it, right? And so you can, if you delete that directory tree, then everything's gone from the service. And if you, if you uh, copy it to another machine, then you have copied the entire thing, and which is very, very different from RPM, where all these files are distributed, some are distributed in user bin, some in user lib, some in Etsy, some in, in, in var, and so on. And so if you wanted to move it along or remove it, then you actually need an explicit tool that actually then knows again what belongs to what. Um, Another goal is I really, really want to feel, uh, to make the, the, the feel for, uh, of the management of these portable services to be exactly like native services, 
right? Because services are services. It shouldn't matter if they're portable, if they're more isolated, if they're integrated, it doesn't matter. The basic concepts of starting them, stopping them, introspecting them um, are kind of the same always, and they should be the always, uh, always the same way, and they should hence be exposed the same way, with the same commands, uh, with the same concepts. Um, so uh, these were the goals, right? Like I, I hopefully made clear now where I position portable services and why we created portable services or like um, what our goals were when we did that. But what was the precise use case for this? Um, or the reason for coming up for this. For me, I'm a service management guy, right? I, I, I wrote a big part of Systemd, and uh, I do care about service management. And I think uh, um, service management um, uh, is, I mean, it's crucial to build an operating system, but I also think that we have to learn from what's happening around us, and containers happened around us. So we have to, like, see what's useful for us. Like, um, are there st things that are interesting in the outside world, but also we should think about uh, for service management. For me, uh, portable services are th the next step for service management, like bringing it up to the level, breathing new life to a concept that has been as old as Unix has. Um, also, um, something I realized um, is everything already has a system to service file, right? We are um, at the position like everything that is uh, 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 provided for RHEL 7, for example, already has a system to service file, right? If you if you if you install the RPM, it's already there. So I kind of uh, um, thought it's it's. Like, you know, for containers, you always have to create new metadata if you package up, right? You have to write the Docker file and it creates um, all these kind of JSON descriptions of what's actually uh, shall be done with what security privileges and so on and so on. And I realized that, well, we kind of have this already, right? It's, it's system new service files. Wouldn't it be interesting to just do all this without defining anything new and simply by using the fact that all across um, the IT industry, everything has a unit file everywhere, uh, anyway. So, yeah, and the logic is behind this is like admins are used to service already. Um, let's just make them more powerful. Like, um, for many cases, picking these bits from container management and putting them into service management um, is a natural extension, right? And it's all what, like, many people don't actually need the full uh, container functionality. Like, um, if you, like, yeah, one very um, specific example for this is something that uh, super privileged containers is called. Like super privileged containers is something that inside of Rat Hat I had to um, hear a lot. Super privileged container is supposed to be this this concept where you uh, deploy something as a container on a system, but then it runs with full privileges, right? It's a little bit like taking containers and then ripping half of what containers are out of it and making it more integrated into the system, right? Which is highly problematic because they run in, inside of completely different environments, have the different file system trees and so on. So um, when I saw this, and I was in a couple of discussions and meetings um, in that inside of Red Hat, I saw like, oh my god, this is, this is just like, you may be using the wrong tool for the job, right? And maybe uh, there should be, it should be coming from the other way around, right? Like what the most of those people who were thinking about super privileged containers actually wanted to do is the only thing they were interested in was the bundling. Right, the file system bundling. They wanted to be able to ship whatever they were working on in one image, um, put it on the on the thing, um, and then update it as as one image. And I, I would say, yeah, maybe that's what we should support, and not um, and not use use the really massive tool to do this one thing. Um, also, um, I think integration is good. Um, for many use cases, not bad, right? Like as mentioned, Docker and these kind of things, they're big about isolation, and that's a good thing in many cases. But in many other cases, um, it's not what you want. For example, we're inside of Red Hat, there's these projects to do storage, um, like storage management software and packages up as a container. Now, storage management um, software, by its nature, wants a lot of really, really low-level access to the host operating system because it needs to enumerate storage devices, needs to, to, to configure them, needs to talk to the kernel, needs to do kernel uh, module management, these kind of things. So um, that's integration, right? Like, if you allow your container to do all this, then you actually do care about some level of integration. So, um, yeah. Philosophically, putting the focus on isolation in this case is not necessarily the right thing, right? That said, I mean, this is, will cover some use cases, but um, the Docker use case is a, is a different one, and it makes a ton of sense to have isolation by default for these kind of things. I'm just saying that not all the use cases that people are currently trying to, to uh, implement with Docker is really best solved with Docker. So, um, any questions so far?
Yeah, that's a question. Um, the question is, will this thing kill Snap? Well, no, uh, but I mean, I'm not like, uh, I, I don't know Snap that well. I know some basics that it's a squash of his file system, these kind of things. And uh, the concepts behind that I like very much, right? Like, because it's just a file system that like, image that you ship. But um, uh, I mean, this is about service management, right? Like exposing something with system control. Um, I'm not sure, like Snap, um, also cares about desktop stuff. I definitely do not care about desktop stuff for this, right? Much of the stuff that we're doing here with portable services is, uh, is highly privileged, and hence you cannot use it to install desktop apps. So um, it's a very valid question, but I can't really answer that because I don't know Snap in all detail so well. Um, for me, like, I mean, it's like asking us, will it kill Docker? No, it definitely won't because uh, it has a slightly different uh, use case and also it has a mind share. I mean, this stuff does not, right? Like, that's why I'm here to get the mind share. Um, but yeah, I hope that's kind of an answer. Um, that's another question. Um, so the, the example for like he asked for uh, examples for what can I, like examples for that shall use this kind of portable service setup. Um, like I'm thinking about storage. Like I already mentioned that. Like everything where you do low level stuff and actually want to integrate with the host, right? Like because this stuff allows you to pick exactly the level of isolation integration that you want. Um, so you can, if you want, be able to load like, kernel modules and you get access to the UDF database and all these kind of stuff very naturally. Um, uh, embedded stuff. Right, like um, there are lots of people who who want to do apps on the embedded devices, like car manufacturers and things like that. I think that's worked perfectly. Then I know that uh, one of the really big uh, cloud um, providers actually uses it, where other people would probably use Docker. Right, like so. This is definitely for some cases where you want to use Docker, you can use this too. Um, but it really depends, right? Like what you want to do. It's. Uh, it's yeah. Everything that is a, lot, a little bit more more low level focus is probably. Um, um, the most interesting bit, right? Like, where you actually do care about the integration. I hope that's an answer. Um, okay, so much about the background, why we want all this, and uh, where this conceptually fits. Um, let's now think about uh, what this technically uh, meets, it means. So, uh, uh, one thing first is Portable servers are, to me, just an extension of uh, what Systemd already does. Systemd natively already supports two kinds of services. System 5 services, like the classic ones, and the native ones, right? Systemd native unit files. And uh, the way it supports um, these, uh, these two is like it converts System 5 uh, scripts dynamically at boot into native ones, and then everything's native. Um, with portable services, I now want to extend this all so that we s support a third kind of, uh, of service, which is the portable service. Um, what's also important uh, to notice is like with uh, the like portable services um, they don't actually um, redesign anything inside of systemd right like they do not add any new real infrastructure to systemd they don't uh, um, reinvent anything that is inside of systemd um, they just what they do is they use the existing apis that systemd has acquired over the years and puts them together in a, in a slightly nicer more uniform way right um, so that uh, a, a one specific like um, a concept becomes much much easier to use right um, now these building blocks that this is built from right like these various apis these various concepts the system has introduced over the years can actually be used in different ways as well right for example um, you could probably coming back to the snap thing probably use these concepts these building blocks and easily put together a snap executor and with the same stuff so for me the portable services are two things right first of all there are something that people can actually use Right, where how you package your stuff up and works, but they're also supposed to be showcase how you can uh, convert foreign service formats into native stuff and integrate really nicely with systemd so that it ex expose that if it was um, something native. Um, 
Um, so the question was regarding like uh, with all the functionality the system has acquired regarding private uh, like 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 um, transient slash temp directories transient users and kind of that will this be replaced by portable services? No, that's precisely the point I wanted to to make. Portable services take these features precisely these features and most of my other slides that follow will just talk about that and put them together in a nice way. Right, so it's the culmination, the result of of having all this in place. But so far, it was all just individual little um, disconnected bits that you could put something together with. But uh, it was left so far to the users to put them together in the way they want. Right, with portable service, I want to put them all together for you, give you an offer. Hey, this is how you can do it. By the way, this is super useful. Use it. But also, um, by the way, these building blocks are also open for you anyway. Um, you can just use them. Um, in any other concept you want, invent your own kind of service management, um, just reuse what we already have. Um, any other questions at this point? Um, it's real. I mean, uh, that's why the uh, if we go back, portable services are ready to use. <laughs> Uh, how you can use it? Uh, well, I mean, let's jump ahead in the slides. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have many examples here, but this is kind of the most interesting slide. But maybe let's talk about that later, actually. Um, also, you could probably just read uh, this uh, blog story, which tells you in detail how to use it. But I, I'm not going to do a, a demo here because I'm afraid of demos. They usually go wrong in, in, in talks. But uh, yeah, I mean, there, there, there needs to be something left for you to do, right? It's, uh... Anyway, let's jump back to uh, where we were. Um, this is where we were. OK, uh, any questions at this point otherwise? OK. so. Uh, I talked a lot about resource bundling, right? The way how we do resource bundling is by putting it together in a disk image. A disk image for portable services can be um, it, mostly two different things. What's important, though, is I did not want to define anything new in this area, right? Docker and all these kind of things always did, right? They, they came up with this concept where you have layers of tarballs that can mask out other layers and, and remove files with AUFS and whatnot. So they came up with this co complex concept of, of uh, um, uh, yeah, delivering the resource bundles to the system and then unpacking them and uh, setting them up together. What I really like about the Snap thing that was mentioned there is that it doesn't do that, right? Like Snap is just one uh, file that you command. That's, I love that idea, and that's why we do it the same way, actually. So, uh, but the, the, the really, really important thing is I did not want to define anything new, which is the same thing as the Snap people designed. So this does not design. Um, uh, like an invent any new disk format or anything like this. You can use anything that the Linux kernel can read natively, which is um, either on the file system level a directory or part of a subvolume or whatever you have, or a, uh, a, a file system, either in a, in, a, in, a, in a block device or in a, in a loopback file. Um, yeah, uh, so the key really is no new image format. Um, and the services can directly uh, run directly from it, which is a result from the requirement that the Linux kernel shall be able to read and write it directly, right? Because yeah, if it can, then we can run our binaries and everything directly from it. So uh, um, yeah, this effectively means either root directory. Root directory, by the way, is a, a system concept that has been there for a long time. It's to root. Right, and uh, in that regard, it's uh, like most of the, what we're doing here with portable services is nothing fancy at all. It's just root reinvented into something more modern, more useful. Right, like which ultimately is the same thing as container does anyway. But uh, yeah, so root directory is um, a key um, a component that makes portable services work. Um, Systemd nowadays has also root image, which is very similar to root um, directory. The difference being. Um, root directory takes an actual directory, which is going to be the root directory for the container. Root image takes a file, um, and uh, then it assumes that there's some Linux file system inside of that, and then it will mount it and use that as the root um, for the for the image. So uh, um, one's a true root, and the other one is a LO setup mount plus a true root. Um, so it's ultimately. You could say that portable services are a, a, a way about fixing true roots, like how we always used it on Unix, like with postfix and these kind of services that do true root, um, in a somewhat um, sane way. 
So actually, um, because we live in 2018, um, the stuff that Systemd does um, there with the root image is actually much nicer than applying to root because it can actually do crypto and verity and these kind of things with the images. So you can actually deploy a cryptographically secure uh, uh, um, a service on a machine and can be very sure that uh, uh, it has full online uh, validation so that uh, you cannot do offline modifications of it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, I love that kind of stuff, the cryptography that we can do there. Um, it's a hard sell, I guess, because people don't understand how awesome this is, but I just wanted to mention that this exists. Um, an image that is suitable as a portable service image um, just needs to carry system to unit files, needs to carry a OS, uh, user lib OS release file, and that's already it. Uh, user lib OS release, for those who don't know, is something we introduced in really early versions of systemd. It's how operating systems like Linux distributions are supposed to identify themselves, right? Basically, the logic that we're following here is that if that file exists in an image, we know it's something Linux, uh, like a Linux disk image in some form, right? So we require that. And then uh, we require the system unit files inside of that image. And that's all we, already uh, all we do, right? If you have any disk image, a directory, or a loopback file that has these two kinds of files in there, then it will already qualify as a portable service. Um, so that's the first thing. That's so much about the about the resource bundling, right? Like this is the image format that we define that we actually don't define because it already exists. Um, sorry. That's a good question. So the question was, is there anything about uh, distribution or just about bundling? If we go back to the slides that I had early on. Uh, I made this comparison here that containers are resource bundling, isolation, and delivery, right? I don't care about the delivery part. I only care about resource bundles, integration, and sandboxing, right? So I don't really care how the images actually get on the machine. That's for you to solve, right? It could be SCP, could be rsync, it could be uh, wget. We actually do provide you with a little tool that just does HTTP and gets it from somewhere. But that is mostly a tool for developers to test their stuff. It's not really a tool how you ever want to deploy anything like this. Sorry? Um, so the question was regarding CA Sync, which is another tool that I wrote. Yes, I think that would be useful for that, but uh, um, it's not integrated yet that it, you can actually use it. But yeah, it, it very much fits into this thing. I want CA Sync to be to be a, a tool for delivering these images, and it would be perfectly uh, fitting for portable services as well. But again, like this is a, I don't care how you get the image on there. Um, like CA Sync would be one option and knock yourself out, but you can uh, solve that with any other. You can even use RPM if you like. Like you could take a disk image, put it in. RPM and it's deployed with DNF or something like that. If that's how you roll, then that's how you roll. Um, uh, yeah, so much about the bundling. Let's now talk about the second thing that I had there about portable services, which is about the um, uh, sandboxing. So as you know, system services on Linux are generally uh, very much integrated into the rest of the system. They, by default, um, inheriting from System 5 in its scripts, they have no isolation from the host whatsoever. Right? They run as root by default, um, and only if the daemon itself decides to drop privileges ever, they um, run less than uh, completely privileged. Um, in systemd, over the, the the years, we acquired quite a few sandboxing options: private devices, private network, and these kind of things. Right? I don't really. I think maybe at this very conference last year, I did talk about security features. Um, so many of the, like, if you have been here last year, you probably should know um, uh, some of them already. Um, what Portable Service now does, it just takes all these and says, uh, yeah, this is the isolation that you do with Portable Services, um, uh, and makes them a little bit more accessible, and we'll show how that goes. Um, yeah, I'm not going into the detail what this all means, but uh, just to make a point, we probably will add even more about this over the as, as things progress, um, so they can lock things down further. Um, What's also interesting is that very recently we added uh, PSS firewalling to, to systemd. It only works on CVSV2, so only very recent uh, kernels and stuff. But uh, this is actually awesome because the main thing nowadays, if you ever deploy something um, on an uh, internet device um, of some form servers or, or, or IoT device or something, is that you want to control very precisely if it has access to the internet or not and what it can do there. So we added this, um, the per-service firewalling, where you can basically say, yeah, this service shall be able to access local hosts and 
the server shall be access no IP at all, and this server shall be able to access everything. Um, and this is like a key concept also of the sandboxing that we're talking about here in the context of uh, portable services. Um, yeah, one key difference though from uh, between portable services and traditional um, uh, native systemd services and uh, and system five services um, for portable services, all the sandboxing is going to be opt out, not opt in. Right? We default to a strong sandbox, but if you then want to have punch holes into it, by all means do just unset these things. But the idea really is, yeah, by default everything is secure, locked down, isolated. Right? Um, the key here, like, I mean, ideally, we would have done the same thing for System 5 uh, uh, scripts and for native unit files um, as well, right? Like, it would be a much better default if we had locked down everything by default. I mean, that's how you do security. You, you, uh, you don't blacklist stuff, you whitelist stuff, right? Um, now, we can't really do this because uh, compatibility, right? Like, System 5 init and all these things, everything that we inherited there is way older, and we cannot just go and say, now everything's forbidden that used to be allowed, uh, because then basically everything will just stop working right so uh, for a system 5 and native classic uh, system unit uh, uh, files is kind of the ship sailed but if you introduce something new portable services we can just switch the the, uh, the flip the switch and say sandboxing is uh, is now the default um, yeah, so much about the bundling and about the isolation there are a couple of other problems we we need to solve though that are kind of hard um, uh, yeah, any questions at this point? Okay, uh, the hard problems. One of them that we solved is dynamic users, right? Um, if you like, if you think about classic Unix services, and the way how uh, uh, privilege separation is done there is with uh, users, with system users, right? Apache runs as HTTP user, and uh, 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 Cups runs as LP user or Cups user or something like that, right? Now. We said that we wanted this uh, concept of leave no artifacts. And that basically means that if you drop in a portable service on a system and remove it again, there should not be users sticking around. Um, to solve this problem, we came up with something called dynamic users. And that's actually a much harder problem than it sounds at first, right? Dynamic users are basically something, it's a Boolean, you set it for a service, and um, if you do, and that service is started up, we dynamically allocate a user ID for it, we run that service under that user ID, and when that service goes down, um, we deallocate the user ID again, right? Without making any change to etsy past WD. Now, this sounds easy enough. It's much harder than it sounds, though, because I already mentioned the sticky um, user ID ownership, file ownership problem, right? If that user creates a file somewhere at some random location, um, uh, it gets owned by that user ID, hence when we recycle it, um, something else might get access to files it shouldn't get access to. The solution uh, to, this, uh, to this problem that we implemented is we simply don't allow um, the service to write files at arbitrary places. Right? So basically, if you turn this on, you also um, get uh, turned on some sandboxing features that basically make all the mounts that you see read only. Right? So that basically, with the exception of a couple, like for example, private TMP, you get your private slash temp. That's where you can write stuff, nowhere else by default. Right? So we know that you cannot write anything anywhere, um, and hence we don't have to clean it up after you. We don't have to keep track what you wrote, because we know you couldn't have written anything anywhere anyway. So, um, yeah, of course, um, just doing slash temp, having that as the only writable place is a bit limiting, right? Like uh, the few services probably don't want to store any kind of data forever. Um, so uh, 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 the way how this works is that the, you can do uh, uh, um, state directory equals in a, in a unit file. And if you do, you get your own private directory in var lib and this is going to be uh, shown um, to you uh, when you start up. Um, and this is secure for the one reason that um, it's actually var lib slash private slash your directory. And the private directory, like this, this, this intermediate directory that is, we put in the middle there, has no access mode, to, uh, like has a zero access mode. So nobody but root can access it. This is, a, this is like something that we actually took um, an inspiration from container managers because they have a very similar problem. Because if you have a container tree somewhere, then the files inside of the container tree are generally 
normally owned by user IDs that exist in a container, but also on the host, right? And you need to make sure that the users from the host do not access the files um, uh, that are owned uh, by the same user ID inside of the containers. So um, the way they came up with it is that uh, varlib containers or wherever they put the containers itself is is um, not accessible um, for non root users, and hence you can be sure that there's no way how these unprivileged users can actually get access to these files and containers, if you follow what I mean. We did the same thing for this, and hence um, fix that problem. Now, the interesting thing is now, if you have one of these state, state directory things, and you have your own directory, and there are lots of files on there, and then you uh, um, shut down, then it stays around with the old user IDs. When you then start up again, and uh, we allocate a user ID for you again, it might be different than the user ID that you got from the first run, right? The way around this is we just recursively churn everything in this case, right? We try to optimize this so um, that it is highly likely that you will get the same user ID. We do this by hashing the numeric user ID from from the, from the name of the service and things like that. But uh, in the off chance that there actually is um, a, a relabeling, like a renumbering in place, we will have to churn. Yeah. If, do you follow at this point? It's, uh, uh, well, I mean, um, it's the churning, the recursive one, is, will only be done in the case where the renumbering taking place. So it's not the common case. It's the it's the corner case. I mean, this is it's not that this wouldn't happen. It does happen because the the namespace is too small, right? Like we only use um, by default, I think, uh, sixteen thousand different user IDs. That's not that much. Um, so conflicts do happen, and then we have to churn. But as it turns out, at least for all the workloads I tried it with, um, the recursive churning is that cheap. Um, uh, Linux has been optimized in that regard, and if I go down and reach shown an entire file system tree with Linux installed into it, it never took more than a couple hundred milliseconds, right? So bad, but hopefully the, the, uh, um, the corner case and not the common case. Um, and maybe in the future, we can save this uh, problem properly by, uh, um, by uh, 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 not requiring this, but using something like ShiftFS or something like the kernel people have been working on, on being able to remap user IDs dynamically so that instead of actually doing changes on disk, we just mount it differently and don't have to, to recursive churn anything. Uh, what's going to happen with disk quotas in case of dynamic users? With disk quotas, yeah. Um, uh, well, you can't have them, right? Like not 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 classic ones, at least, right? Not the the the. I mean, you can, but of course they will lose yeah. the, the the meaning. But uh, um, what's very high on the our to do list is actually to use you know project quotas, like project pro, like yeah. um, are this new concept where you have a new ID, um, mm. and then this uh, these project quotas, yeah. But then my my intention is really to hook that up with service management, so that when a service is created for the first time, we dynamically allocate a project ID. Uh, a quota for that. We can very easy check if that's already in use is on the same disk, right? And then you can basically have per service quota. Basically, you can then say my SQL um, gets 400 gigabytes, and you can actually write that down in the in the service file itself, where I think it should be. So, denoted. is the project ID persistent then? Um, well, I mean, it's going to be the same as for the recursive churn case. Yes, the, the project ID is going to be persistent, um, but uh, we might uh, need to read. Project, I like uh, change the ownership <laughs> of the of the tree in case of conflicts, right? Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm fully aware of the problem, um, uh, and uh, we need to fix that. But I really, really would like to hook up quota magically to uh, uh, um, service management anyway, because I think if somebody does system control status MySQL service, he should totally see um, uh, uh, the the disk usage of that service. I mean, it's kind of stupid that we don't expose that at this point. I mean. Unix, ha. Huh. Uh, any other questions at this point in time? Um, so how, how much time do I still have? I got like... Actually, one question here. <laughs> um, where? Oh, yeah. there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so what if your service is like, okay, bad portable service and it actually needs to write somewhere, not in private and not in TMP? And will you actually prevent from removing the service unless those files are deleted or we are back to the well, ownership problem? So uh, you cannot uh, write anything uh, anywhere anyway, right? Like wherever you can write, if you have this turned on, um, we will uh, uh, remove it with your service anyway, okay. right? Okay. Um, but uh, then again, we do actually provide people with hooks to break out of the sandbox if they want to, but people shouldn't. Yeah. So. If it breaks sandboxes, then it's our fault. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, but I mean, breaking the sandbox is is by declaring in the unit file, like with privileges as the administrator in in, in advance that there is a hole in the sandbox. It's not that the the payload could break it out if it wanted to on its own. Um, Another problem, uh, like, I mean, if you ever played around with Cheroots on Unix, um, you know the thing, like, where, let's say you ran, ran postfix or whatever you ran um, in inside of a change root on a host, then uh, um, you would always have to synchronize the user databases between the Cheroot environment and the host, right? Because otherwise, you will have this problem that they might have different ideas what user ID means which user, um, and then... Uh, weird things happen, right? Like because then uh, processes that shouldn't get access to some IPC object suddenly get access to some IPC object, and and and, and similar problems. So. Uh, um uh, this problem um, we try to solve with uh, a new concept called uh, private users. It's another sandboxing f uh, feature. If you do that, if you turn that on for a service, what actually happens is that uh, we use username spacing, which I hope you all know about uh, because uh, uh, there was a talk earlier about that concept. Um, we use that username spacing concept to define a, a, its own username space where we apply a mapping that maps the root user to the root user, that maps the service's own user to the service's uh, own user, like, like a one-to-one -one mapping in that regard. But all other users um, are mapped to the nobody user. right? So that basically means if you're living in such an environment, environment, you do PS, then all the services that you see are either owned by root, by yourself, or by nobody, right? Like with the, by the nobody user, like six five five uh, three four. Um, so that's our way out. So that instead of trying to synchronize the user databases, we just say make them redundant, right? Like because we noticed one thing: um, while uh, the precise UID to system user mappings might differ between systems, and no distributions agree, even when they define static ones, on three users, they, uh, like on two users, they generally do agree. Which is the root user, like on all Unix distributions, root equals zero and zero equals root, um, and uh, the other one is nobody, which is like nobody has different names like on fedora um it's called nfs nobody for some reason and on debian it's called nobody um but uh, at least the user exists always and it has always the same meaning um so yeah it's not pretty that they have different names and we should really uh, change fedora and, and rel to move to the debian naming but uh yeah this is ongoing so yeah the, to deal with user database mismatch we came up with this mapping of just making it redundant so that it doesn't matter um, there are other problems still, like Dbus, for example, can't really deal with, um, like there are a couple of services like Dbus even, which um, isn't happy with dynamically changing um, user databases, because what Dbus does, it, uh, when it initializes, it uh, reads this policy, like this weird XML policy it has, resolves all the users, and then um, remain, has that in memory, and just look, uses the resolved uh, username. So now if we keep creating and removing users dynamically, then this model doesn't fit, right? But I think, like uh, the dynamic users concept, to me at least, it breathes a whole new life into Unix um, uh, security because, I mean, the, the quintessential Unix security um, concept is the user after all, right? But they used to be very, very expensive. You had to um, re register one or two or maybe five, but never more in your RPM when you installed something. So they were very precious to create because you couldn't even clean them up ever. Um, you only had very few traditionally. Uh, you had 100, and then on Fedora you got 500, and nowadays you get a thousand. But yeah, so you couldn't just just throw them out like if they were candy. With the with the dynamic users, they do become candy. And if that's not great, then I don't know. Um, yeah, we only got 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna like we have. Uh, I can talk a little bit about what's in scope and out uh, scope um, for this stuff, um, just to make this clear. But uh, I kind of want to put the focus on this slide um, that we had quickly seen earlier. Um, how does it actually uh, feel to work with this? Um, if you run current systemd, there's this new tool called Protocol Control. 
Um, and uh, basically, uh, there are two major verbs. You can do portable control attach and portable control detach. What attach does, it takes one of these portable images, which, as mentioned, can be a loopback file with maybe a squashFS inside, but it could also be XT4, or a directory, right? Something that is Unix accessible and where there's an OS tree in there. If you do portable control attach, then what it does, it copies out a specific set of unit files from this image, puts them into Etsy systemd system, um, extends them slightly by adding root directory um, or root image lines for it, and applies an additional security um, uh, drop-in that locks them down further. That's all that portable control attach does. So what does it actually mean, what it does? It basically takes out these units, makes them available on the host as if they were um, native uh, unit files from the host, and then makes sure through these root directory and root image lines that it adds to these, um, that it points back to the original image file, right? So after doing the protocol to attach, these unit files are basically the very same thing as they would be if you had just put them on the, the host um, and natively, right? And that's really all there is to it. Just copying this file out, adding root directory, and bam, you have your portable service attached, right? At that moment, you can execute all the other system control commands on them. You can uh, start them, you can stop them, you can enable them, you can disable them, you can do system control status, you can do kill, whatever you want. You can see the logs because um, at this point in time, they are really native system unit, uh, units. They are not different anymore besides the fact that they actually happen to use root directory or root image, right? If you do portal control detach, all of this is undone, right? The files are, uh, um, that were copied out are removed again, um, and uh, yeah, uh, you ha have no artifacts in the system. So um, yeah, I kind of mentioned this already. This whole concept introduces zero new metadata, right? There's no new disk format. We could just use what Linux always had. We don't do any new service format. We just use the unit files we already have. We, um, uh, yeah, there is no new metadata. Like, we don't even have uh, metadata that informs us um, about what the image contains because we just use the OS release stuff that already has been around on, on, on Linux now for six years or something, right? So, yeah, that's a key thing. We invented a new format here without actually inventing a new format, which is kind of what I like. So this also has nice effects. It basically means you can use pretty much any tool uh, you want to generate these images, right? Like you can use Vagrant or, or the Bootstrap if you want and prepare an image from this. Um, and it's going to be qualified as a portable service image, right? Like because if you install any current distribution, if it's Debian or Fedora or Ubuntu, it doesn't matter, it will have unit files in there. It will have an OS release file in there and uh, will work on a Linux tree. So it's, it's a portable image. And that's kind of that's nice, actually, because it actually allows you to, to create images that are multi-mode, that you can uh, attach as a portable service to a system that you can uh, uh, run in an endspawn container, that you could run in a VM, that you can run on bare metal, and it could be the very, very same image that implements all this. Um, what's also interesting is, um, while I call this portable services, it's not just service units that can be in that image, it can be socket, target, path, and timer units too. Which is kind of cool, because you basically can say, I have this image and I want to run and shall run a timer. You just put the timer uh, unit in there, that's, that's how it works. Uh, what's, by the way, um, really uh, relevant to notice, um, portable control attach will not copy out all unit files that are in there. What it does, it, uh, if, let's say, the image file, in this case, it's a loopback file called foobar-4711.raw, if it's named like this, then it will copy out everything that starts with um, the, uh, the prefix until the dash, which in this case is foobar. So uh, um, it's it's very wow. Well, uh, that's a stupid uh, typo. There was a timer, timer. Uh, you know that part. But um, yeah. So all you have to do is like um, if you want to ship, let's say, your application uh, foobar as an image, just make sure that you call the call the image file name foobar dash whatever you want, and then call the services um, foobar. What it was, any kind of suffix, and there you go. Like you can uh, even uh, have multiple servers inside of the same image, just call them foobar dash valdo, foobar dot cooks, whatever you want. It's completely up to you. Um, yeah, I, you, I already mentioned the triple use images, like images that are suitable for booting on bare metal in, in a container, like n spawn star container, and uh, 
and uh, uh, also our um, attachable portable services. Anyway, uh, my time is mostly over. Just cover the one last thing, which is profiles. I mentioned this earlier that for, for this kind of stuff, uh, the security um, stuff should be opt out then opt in. The way we implement that is by defining uh, by default four profiles, but actually anybody can um, define additional profiles if he wants to. A, pro a profile is nothing fancy. It's just a, a drop-in um, that is added to the service files copied out that lists a couple of sandboxing options. There's default, which is um, a couple of sandboxing options that are pretty common sense, right? It takes away the right to change the system clock and takes the right uh, way to load kernel modules and kind of things. But uh, it doesn't require too much changes. There's also strict, which is uh, much um, stricter, right? Um, as the name suggests, it basically prohibits everything, right? It turns on all the sandboxing features that we even have um, in systemd. So if you have a payload that, uh, that does not need to do anything fancy, then use that. But in that case, um, you can't access the network or anything, right? There is trusted, which is the opposite. Trusted, if you use that profile, then basically you can do anything, right? Then you have full integration. So if you do, if you do, uh, um, if you do something like storage thing and want to ship it as a portable service, um, use that, and you have full access to the host. You can load kernel modules, anything, because you run with no sandboxing. And there's no network, which is much like default, with the only difference that there's no network access. Yeah, and th these are the four ones that we came up with that kind of made sense to us. But uh, again, like I'm pretty sure that people want to do do uh, their own profiles. Um, you can, when you do a protocol attach, you have a dash p switch, and you can specify the profile, like with which security level, how much do you trust the portable um, servers that you attach, and then we'll use this. I hope this makes sense. And let's. Uh, yeah, by the way, I have this build tool that you can use as images, but again, it's just an option. You can use any tool you like. Um, this is the URL where you find for, for the details and where you can actually uh, like see command lines that, that you can use. Um, and now I just want to ask for further question because I think we still have one minute or something. Um, so uh, there's a question. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, but currently, I can start um, a systemd unit and have the service confined with the up armor if I want, and it works very transparently. Do I, do I understand correctly that the same probably applies here, that I would be able to write an up armor profile for a portable service? Um, so that's a very good question. Like uh, I'm not an R, like like I'm I'm working for Red Hat, right? And Red Hat everything is SL Linux and not Up Armor. So uh, we have the Up Armor support in Systemd, but it's not something I personally am very used to. It's, it's a patch that somebody else from Canonical contributed, or actually probably not even from Canonical. But uh, conceptually, um, it would make a ton of sense to uh, make this possible. But I don't know enough from Up Armor, but it would make a lot of sense to me so that there could be an Up Armor. Uh, 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 profile even contained in the image and one from the host that is con uh, combined like this. Um, so one of the trusted, pro like the profiles, for example, they probably could be extended um, on app armor supporting systems um, to also do app armor uh, for the lockdown. I, like if, you, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, totally send me the patches. Would love to integrate them. But uh, yeah, you don't expect that from me because like on my distribution, I don't have this. Uh, there will be uh, some feasible alternative uh, for NSPAWN ephemeral containers. Sorry? Uh, is there will be um, something like uh, NSPAWN uh, ephemeral containers. Like NSPAWN ephemeral containers? Yeah. But there already is. I, I mean, yeah, but and you mean for portable services? Yeah, for portable services, uh, such a knowledge. Uh, there is a to-do list item to make it possible that you, that, that uh, yeah, we, we have ephemeral, but we haven't done that yet. But the idea is basically that you could do root directory or root image um, and combine that with ephemeral equals true. And then it does what you would expect it to do, that we do a copy and then we destroy it afterwards. So uh, yeah, definitely just uh, file a bug um, asking for this and we'll put it up our to-do list. For the Hello, thank you. Talk. Uh, will there be uh, support for system running uh, portable services and system D uh, on host systems that doesn't have system D? <laughs> Do they still exist? <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Um, well, you know, um, we need to figure out what we want to support and what we can't support, right? And two init systems fighting about uh, ownership of the system is something we decided that's mm. not something we want to support. Um, so, uh, um, you know, being PID1 comes with certain uh, privileges and with certain requirements, and we fulfill these. And I have a suspicion that the people who would run them like that are probably 15 people in this world and I'm not sure I want to spend my time on fixing that. Also, I have the suspicion the people who um, dislike system use so much probably wouldn't like it much uh, better either if we supported that. So, um, we, just, yeah, we have to figure out what we want to support and what not and we decided that's not, not what we want to support. And uh, I think my time's over, but... Um, uh, one means to, to, to close. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, that's the last slide I had. Thank you for being here. And uh, if, you, if you have any questions uh, further on this, uh, meet me outside or at the party yeah. or tomorrow. And, uh, one second, while you are uh, thinking about the best questions that you receive, I just uh, want to do a simple fact check for, for, for today evening. So we do have buses for the guest again, the name of the guest again on your page. The buses are on the parking side that is opposite to the main entry that you use to enter this building. And uh, tomorrow will be another day and we are waiting here you at 10. So do, actually don't forget about this. So what is the best question? Um, well, that's a problem. There were so many good questions. Um, yeah, uh, what were the questions? Um, um, I remember the one with the snap thing very well. It was a very good question. I'm sure it was the best one, but it's the one I remember the best. Does it count? Okay. Um, what other questions do we have? The ephemeral one? No, well, that's pretty good too. Uh, I don't know, what, what other questions were there? Who thinks who, who asked the best question? Please raise your hands. Oh, I'm gonna try it. Somebody there raised their hand. What was the question? What was the question again? Okay, we find him.